excited about what the Lord wants to do because I know that time and time again I've learned I just need to back off and let God do whatever He's going to do. Something's going to turn up. Amen? Amen. It's my desire that I'd love to have this back up in the middle of town somewhere. I mean, that's where I'd like to have it is in the middle of town. And I just believe that that's going to happen. I don't know when or where or what, but I just I just believe it is. I, I was like Lois and I was talking one day and I said, you know, I just don't think the Lord's through. God shuts one door, puts you through a test a little bit, but He's going to open up a door somewhere or another. And I don't know if, what kind of building or where or what. Somebody said, ain't you got a plan? I said, well, my plan is just to let God do what He wants to do and stay out of His way. Amen? Amen. I just believe that. Now, stand with me tonight. If you don't mind, I'm going to read a, 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 a familiar passage of, of, of Scripture here. And um, I want to first turn to the book of Philippians in chapter number 2 and read a portion of chapter number 2 and then I'm going to flip over here and I'm going to read a portion of chapter 4. But in chapter 2, it says, and starting with verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill, fulfill ye my joy and be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, he's talking about being accountable to one another, watching out, guarding, guarding your brother and your sister. He says, let this mind be in you, which was, a, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in, in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then over in chapter number 4, I want to read a portion starting with verse number 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In other words, God is present right now. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He's talking about praying unto God here. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. Notice he says the peace of God is going to keep your minds through Christ. He also, previously we just read, let this mind be in you which was in Christ. How the mind of Christ. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. Let me back up and start over on that. Verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. He's talking about the things that you and I should seek after. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for everything you give us. Thank you for giving us this place here to worship you and learn of your word. Thank you for your word. And Father, if there's anything in our lives, anything, Lord, that would hinder any sin, we ask you would forgive us of it. And it's blood of Jesus would cleanse us. And, and Lord, we just thank you for everyone that's here tonight. And I pray that you touch the heart and the life of every single person that is in this place. Lord, encourage us. We thank you. For all the trials and the tests that you give us. Because we know that it makes us turn unto you and draw closer. And we'll ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think about prayer. And, and really that's what's been on my heart lately. Is, is about prayer. When I was a little boy, my family didn't go to church. My mama... And my daddy didn't go to church. My mama's folks were all old-time 
hard shell meat once a month Baptist folks. And my daddy's folks were all holiness and Pentecostal folks. And for some reason or another, we wound up, we just didn't go to church. But daddy all the time had radio on. And uh, I'd be sitting on the floor when I was a little boy. And daddy, daddy liked radios. And he liked them old big antique radios from back in the day. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, as a big old cabinet about the size of Volkswagen with a little bitty dial, a couple of knobs on it, he'd, he'd buy those antique radios. Didn't have no FM, it was all AM. But I can remember sitting in the floor there whenever I was a child at night, seven, eight year old, and daddy'd have one of them radios on. I believe it or not, I remember listening to R.W. Schembach as a child preaching out of Tyler, Texas on an AM radio at night. You know that thing, it would kind of come in and go out. Any of you ever listen to WSL, Grand Ole Opry? And, and you know you'd be driving down the road and you hear that thing coming in and then you hear it going away. And, and somehow or another, <clears throat> being raised up as a child, I kind of got in tune with, with that AM, scratchy, fuzzy kind of radio sound. And so, you know, I can, I can flip that on and drive down the road and and have that scratchiness going, and it don't bother me one bit. I just sit over there and listen to that thing, and listen to it scratch and holler and all that. But my wife, on the other hand, cannot stand it. And uh, this past week, we were uh, we had went to Pigeon Forge one night to go and, and see my my cousin plays up there at a the theater, and we had went to uh, ride up and watch the Christmas show up there, and so going over the Smokies, our FM radio started sounding like an AM radio because it was going in and out and it was scratchy and fuzzy and everything. And she had about had all that she could take. And she said, that thing is going off. I can't stand that. Because it was a... <laughs> you'd hear a little bit. <laughs> and then you'd hear another station coming in trying to overtake that FM station. And she just, she just had about all that she could stand. And I had decided that on this trip that I was going to start out my whole weekend on a positive note. Any of you ever decide you ever going to do that? You're just going to wake up and say, I'm going to have a positive day. That's a great outlook to have, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great outlook to have. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, the one you love is awake. I, I thank you, Lord, for the sun coming up. I thank you for the birds shining and everything like that. So we were we were starting out our weekend like that. And I, I, I was jostling around with her and we'd be talking about something and, and I'd say, but but on a positive note, you know, I'd, I'd throw that in there. I said, I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying to be productive. I'm, I'm trying to be less negative in my life and I'm going to be more positive about things. Well, what we didn't realize was we was about to get the hotel room from hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we, we went up there and we got us a room, and I'm telling you what, boy, it, it, it was a rough one. It made us come home a day early, I'll put it that way. I, we were taking, I was taking my suit down to the truck, and uh, I looked around at her, and I said, boy, as far as I'm concerned, I'd just soon go back to the house. And she said, you want to go back to the house? And I said, let's go. <laughs> so we had 15 minutes to go check out if we was gone. But I was thinking about that. That road trip up there and that fuzzy radio, and I got to thinking, you know, that's a lot like our prayer life. Our prayer life gets kind of fuzzy once in a while, don't it? We can't tell if we're going and coming. We can't tell if we've heard from God or, or even if God's even hearing from us because we can't feel it. We feel like the heavens are brass. We feel like we've hit a brick wall. We feel like... We can't go any further. And, and I've, been, I've been pondering that a whole lot over the years, but here a whole lot lately I've been thinking about why it is that we have such a tough time praying. Why it is that we, 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 uh, we call out to God, but somehow or another it's just not that satisfaction that, that we want in our life. We just don't feel fulfilled out of, out of, of talking to God. And I want to tell you something. Talking to the Lord is the most important thing you can do as a child of God here on this earth. You can, you can go out there and you can witness to people and tell them about Jesus, but if you ain't talking to God and hearing from God, then you're just out there just like a, a, a tinkling brass cymbal somewhere or another. There's no, there's no power in behind it. There's no, there's no uh, uh, 
gumption to get up and, and have a reason to do it. There, that you need a you need that that inspiration in your life and my life to, to do what it is, to live for God. And that comes through prayer. You know, the Bible talks about a prayer closet, about going to a place that is in secret, wherever that may be. And finding that time alone with God. Finding that time that you can, you can talk to Him and make your request known. As the Scripture talks about here, that the, the, the peace of God that passes all that understanding, that may comfort you. But there's also that time that whenever I quit, I found out my most productive time with God is when I'm hid away and I just shut up and let Him do the talking. Because I'm going to tell you what God has to say to you is a whole lot more important than what you've got to say to Him. Amen? Amen. Because mine and you, you and me and our, you and I in our, in our, in our little finite being of wisdom here, we get the wires all crossed up once in a while. We're like that fuzzy radio station. We don't know what we want. We're talking to God and we're asking Him for one thing and then we're turning around and asking Him for something else that's going against what we're asking on the other end. You ever know anybody like that? I mean, you got people that's praying for big things to happen and big things to fall out of the sky and if God threw it on them, what would they do with it? They wouldn't be ready for it. They'd mess it up. They'd be like those lottery winners. Those people that win the lottery that six months later are in worse shape than it was whenever they first won the thing. Because they don't know how to handle it with wisdom. And God answers mine in your prayer. And He, he gives you and I the wisdom to be able to receive what it is that we need from Him. So the channel at times is fuzzy because we don't stop long enough in our prayer closet to really listen to what God is telling you and I through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what this inner man is speaking, the saved man, the, the new man that where Christ lives. And so if we find ourselves where we're spending more time yapping than we are listening, then we find ourselves in trouble. And we find that the channel is not clear. Another hindrance that I know that prayer is hindered by in our life is by sin itself. If there's unrepentant, unremorseful, if there's unforgiveness, if there's strife, if there's hatred, if there's malice, if there's gossiping, if there's pride, boy, I, just, I, I could just go on and on and on, couldn't I? But some people will say, well, I can't understand why I can't get a prayer through. I can't understand why I can't get healed from the Lord. I prayed and I prayed, but God won't answer my prayer. Well, it, it may very well be that there's a hindrance somewhere in the phone line. It may very well be like my mama used to get water in the box and you couldn't call her and she couldn't call you. And sometimes whenever there's sin in our life, it hinders us. It hinders us from that, that productive time of being able to, to have that peace from God and that flow because God wants to deal with the problems in our life. God wants to deal with the things that fall short. God wants to deal with, with sin that is totally contrary and against God. Did you know God is pure? Amen. Amen. The Bible says that God is love. And God is pure. And what is sin? Sin is the enemy of God. Sin is the thing that will hinder the flow of grace from God into your life. Did you know that if you have unrepentant sin in your life and you take a prideful arrogance and says, Well, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to walk on. And, and, and you know what? I am who I am and God knows who I am, but I'm just going to walk on and, and I'm not going to repent and I'm not going to change. And, and, and You may not say that in so many words, but that's the attitude. That may be the attitude of the person. How many of you have ever run into people that were prideful that wouldn't change? That wouldn't look back objectively at where they were in life and realize that they were walking in a path that was contrary to what the Lord wanted in their life. And that becomes sin. That becomes sin. And then they, then they wonder why they're going through the problems that they're going through. It's because they're walking in the wrong path. 
The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but if you can't hear from God where those steps are to be and use the wisdom of God to be able to find them steps, then you're walking in the wrong path. You've got people that have allowed sin to come into their homes, come into their, their lives, come into their families, come into the, the workplace and have took over their life and they're struggling in life. They're struggling to make it. They're struggling to have peace. They're struggling to have victory in their life. And the reason is, is because the grace has been cut off. The flow of the, of the grace of God, of the blessing of God has been cut off in their life. And it's because their prayer life has been hindered. And one of the biggest hindrances that the church has today is sin. That's why they can't hear from God. That's how come you find these churches with so many programs going on. It's because they're really trying to make up for the lack of spirituality that is in the, the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, you know, I like our stripped down version of church. I really do like it. I, it's like I told somebody here a while back, I said, you know, if we ever was to start a Sunday service, I don't want a lot of stuff going on. I mean, there's a lot of people that would say, well, you know, hey, I'm excited. We'll get this program going and, and we'll get this program going and we'll start this and we'll start this ministry over here and we'll, we'll feed the raccoons down on Lee Street and we'll go over here and we'll have this activist group and we'll join up with these folks over here. Listen, save it for the Salvation Army. What I love is the bare bones of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, 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 and not all uh, tangled up with all kinds of different programs and all kinds of different avenues, but a very stripped down version to where you simply have worship in the Word and prayer because I think those are the most important things and activities that there is in the body of Christ and the rest of it is just icing around the cake. As far as that goes. But one of the reasons why that, that it doesn't seem to work is because of sin in the body of Christ. Unrepentant sin in the body of Christ. God doesn't want anything in your life that hinders His grace from flowing into your life. And as I said, I could sit here all night and name off all kinds of things that hinder that. All kinds of sin. Pride. Lust, liars, gossipers, backbiters, malice in attitude, pr proud look, people that are that are have idols made out of and listen, the Bible says you can't serve God and serve mammon at the same time. Everybody always hollers that that's money. But listen, mammon is anything there is that stands between you and God. Amen. That's really what it means. Your church can become mammon to you. If you worship the denomination or you worship the movement that you're affiliated with more than you do the living God who is invisible and all-powerful, then guess what has become your idol? There are people, I kid you not, I know people that would fight you and, and just, just hinder their victory over a nameplate. And I don't know whose that is, but they would... They would, yeah. don't you dare sit on grandma's old pew. That's her name. She bought that pew. She made up $100 and we put the plate on the end of it. That, that's the same way with the stained glass windows. I've been in buildings where they have the stained glass windows in memory of so and so. And there's people that will come and sit down beside it and say, Praise God, ain't that just beautiful? And their focus is on the, the sanctuary. Their, their focus is on the, the wooden altar bench or the wooden pulpit or something like that. And that in itself becomes their idol. Let me tell you, that's what I love about just going to any old building because that ain't the church. You're the church. You're the sanctuary. The sanctuary is right here. The tabernacle is right here. Holy Ghost filled tabernacle right here. And God wants a, a clean tabernacle. He wants you to repent of whatever it is that's hindering that flow of grace into your life. Now, I'm going to tell you another one. 
Another one. Let me read a, a little portion of this over again right here. I'm going to read the very last part of what I, I read. This is Paul's instruction. This is God the Holy Ghost's instruction to Bruce Weeks, to Melvin Hughes, to Missy Neese, to Lois Weeks. This is God's instruction to everybody under the sound of my voice, and even the ones that are not here tonight. He says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and whatsoever things are honest, what now what's he saying here? What's he saying now? This finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. What what kind of list is he just named off to us right here? Of, of a, a positive a, a, a positive list. Anybody got another adjective for that besides a positive list? It, it's good. It, it, it's a, it's a pure list. Amen. It, it's a it's a it's a. It, it's a it's a list that that list is things that 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 basically is God Himself in in a sense that it's an attribute. He says, "Whatsoever things are true, is God true?" Amen. 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 God is truth. The Bible even tells us that. Whatsoever things are honest. What about the nature of God? Is He honest? I mean, he, 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 he gives a just weight, right? There's going to come a day when the end of time comes or the end of time as we know it. Whenever the wicked are going to be judged and God's not going to do it with a, an, an unfair balance, is He? He's going to be honest, ain't He? Amen. He's going to be able to point to that sinner and He's going to be able to tell them where they fell short. Let me tell you something. When you and I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, saved, and the motives of the things that we have done in this life are judged, and the rewards are handed out on the on the, the judgment seat of Christ day. Our motives are going to be judged. We ourselves will be saved, but I've got news for you. There's going to be some rewards that maybe I thought I had. They are going out the window because I didn't do them honest. I did them with another motive in mind besides serving Jesus. See, when you feed the hungry, you better have it in your heart that you're serving Jesus, that you're not just feeding somebody that's hungry. You better have it in your heart that, that you're doing that to Jesus. Because Jesus said it. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you put clothes on me. He said, when you done it to the least of these, you done it unto me. That's what he says, right? So whenever you see someone in, in that position and you go to help them, you don't say, well, hey, look at me. Look how great I am because I'm helping them. You say, no, I do it because of Christ. I'm doing it because of Jesus. I'm doing it unto Jesus. So the Bible says that if you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it unto Jesus. Amen. So you begin to look at Him as honest. <clears throat> He said, whatsoever things are just. We talked about that. Whatsoever things are pure. God is pure. Do we under... <clears throat> Lord, we live in such a dirty old filthy world out here and we got it all over us every day. We are affected by it in one way or the other. You can't drive down 75 without something speaks to you off of a billboard. You can't go through this day without some kind of impure thought in your life. Now, some of you might think you can, but you can't. You might not be thinking of something like robbing a bank or some sexual uh, immorality or something like that. But I guarantee you, everybody in this place, at some way or another, you have an impure thought during the day. You watch something on TV, you listen to something on the radio, or you're on that phone talking to somebody, talking about somebody. Amen? Yeah. We all do that. We hinder, we hinder our prayer life by doing those things. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. 
God is love, isn't He? Whatsoever things are of good report. Ha, the Lord's a good report, ain't He? Yeah. You know, there's a reason why I don't watch the news. Because there's no good reports on the news. I mean, I, between it and those starving dog commercials. <laughs> Yep, they just tear me up about the same way. <laughs> Old folks and dogs just rip my heart apart. That's why I can't go to a dog pound or nursing home. They both just leave me depressed. Good report. If you feed your mind the things of this world, you'll hinder your connection with God. You'll hinder your connection, your prayer life with God. He's talking about putting the godly things into you. The things that, that God wants you to enjoy in life as a child of God. We wonder why we don't have peace in our life. We wonder why we're, we're all the time seem to be struggling up a mountain somewhere and we don't understand what's coming against us. And it, it may be the environment that we as children of God have placed ourselves in that's hindering us. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil is out there to try to make you doubt. Mm -hmm. yes. The devil is out there to make you try to worry about things. Yep. Right. Amen? Yes. Did you know that whenever you're worrying about something... Now, now listen, every great invention that has ever been made, someone saw it before it was ever built. Amen? Amen? I can tell you that when Luke Wheeler built this building right here, old brother Luke Wheeler, I was one of the first preachers to ever preach in this building right after it was built when it was brand spanking new. Its carpet still smelt new in it. But I'm going to tell you, brother Luke Wheeler saw this building in his mind before it was ever built. How many of you drove up here today in an automobile that nobody ever saw before it appeared? I guarantee you every single one of you drove something that somebody seen in their mind before they ever made it. Amen? Every, think about it. Everything, everything there is has got a name attached to it somewhere and somebody saw it. Amen? Why, I don't know who he would have been and probably nobody else does. But somebody invented that style of molding. They saw it before they ever made a blade that would mill it. They said, you know what? I think a piece of molding ought to look like this. Let's have a blade made for it. Somebody, somewhere, I don't know, his name is Bob, Jim... Raphael, who, who, who knows? We, we don't know. But every... Listen, you visualize and see things every day in your life. You see it before you ever do it. Anybody ever get your check and see yourself going to the bank? I bet some of you see yourself crying whenever you pull away from the drive through, don't you? But did you know that the children of Israel in the Bible complained and murmured and griped and worried so much that it grieved God? Did you know that whenever you're sitting around worrying about something, that you are not only tearing down faith in an almighty God who supplies all your needs, but folks, you're visualizing something that's not even going to happen in your life. You see yourself going down in flames. You're borrowing against trouble that probably, most likely, will never even come. And when you feed your soul things like that, I tell you, I, I love my mama. Now me and my mama don't get along all the time. But me and her are very opposite. She's very pessimistic person. She's a very literal person. 
You can't tell her a joke because she don't get it. You've got to explain the joke to her. Because she takes things literal. And she's very pessimistic and very negative at times. And, and I've fought this battle all my life between being positive and negative. And it's real easy to flip over on the negative side and just start bashing and gnashing at the teeth and biting the furniture and everything else. And I've had to make a, a conscious effort in my life to change that. I've asked the Lord. I've said, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to be more positive, more upbeat. Help me to be that person that's not so pessimistic, but be, be more of an optimist that believes good things are going to happen. But my mother, she called me up last night. And she said, Lord, did you hear about that black man that killed all them people? And I was like, no. Well, you need to be watching the news. And then we got told, she said, I, I love my telephone, I love my newspaper, and I love my TV. And I thought to myself, well, that's how come when you call me, it's nothing but bad, 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 bad. And I'm going to tell you something, when all you do is feed your soul bad stuff, what are you going to think about? Bad stuff. You're going to think about bad things, ain't you? That's how come that's how come a lot of them old holiness people didn't believe so much in the radio and the TV. Because they understood that by walking for the Lord and living a life that is full of pure things instead of things that is going to hinder you. Things that's going to hinder your walk with God. And if you don't think those things have an influence, you look at some of these kids and even some of these older people that listen to there's some of these certain types of rap music and stuff like that and then flip out and go go shoot up a school or, or they they sit down and they play those video games on on at home on their consoles and then all of a sudden they try to reenact that in real life into a tragedy into a trouble. It's because they've been influenced by by a very negative sinful world. And whenever you take that stuff in as a child of God, you're, you're, you're straining your relationship with God. I'm not sitting here saying that, that you become lost, but you're hindering the good things that God wants to pour out into your life through a prayer life that is pure, through a prayer life that will furnish you peace on the inside. When you begin to look around your situation and you listen to the report that the world has to say, how that everything is going to hell in a handbasket and everything's bad and you better load up all your guns and, and hide your children and put 40 lots on every door and live in a fear then guess what you're going to draw to yourself? Trouble and fear. But when you trust an Almighty God, and, and, and somebody, some of, the, some of the people might say, well, you transcend. You transcend this world. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you something. That's what a child of God needs to do. You transcend the things of this world. You transcend the tragedies of this world. You live in a higher plane. You live in a higher place than the world lives. You don't look at the situation of the world the same way that the world looks at it. That's how come you've heard me talk so much about uh, uh, looking at this world in, in the way that God's created it. Not the way that mankind's messed it up or the devil's come along or took over the world system. Don't begin to look at, don't begin to look at life the way that, that the rest of the world looks at life. But look at life the way that God planned it out. Look at life the way God wants you to live. If somebody says, well, that's too hard to try to live like that. Well, hey, every day is a struggle and a battle, but, but recognizing who God is and what he, what he has done in your life. Let me tell you, if you'll begin to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings in your life, and you'll be grateful every day whenever you get up and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. You'll see your eyes begin to open and you'll see even more blessings flowing into your life. You'll, you'll change. You'll change as a person. You'll change and you'll say, you know what? 
the Lord is blessing me. Yeah. I got a little trouble down here on this earth. I got some trials and some temptations, and I've got I've got some struggles. But thank God because of the cross, thank God because of Jesus Christ and what He's done for me, I'm able to look at this place in a whole new perspective. Amen. I, I'm going to be excited when the Lord comes back and takes us with Him. But listen, I'm not going to get down right now because I realize I'm a child of God and I'm walking with Him. And I realize greater is He that is in me than He is in the world. Amen. This is why Paul said He'll supply all your needs. He'll give you everything that you stand in need of. But I'm going to tell you, you can't go home and entertain yourself with Jerry Springer and expect to have the blessing of God in your life. Amen, that's right. Because when you let that stuff creep into your soul, and that's what it's doing. That's what it's doing. That's why we think wrongly. Did you know that? I'll give you a good example. You're driving down the road in your car. How many people in here have drove a car? <laughs> I got Richard, you drove a car. I know you have. I've seen you. <laughs> so that's everybody. Beverly, you drove a car, hadn't you? I thought you had because I saw Melvin ride in it one day. <laughs> you, how many of you ever took a trip down the road? And you got to your destination and you didn't even remember driving there. I mean, I have driven 12 hours from the Texas line and didn't even remember the trip when I got back home. And I wasn't sleeping, I was awake. Why? You drove all the way home and you didn't have, you didn't have an accident, did you? You just you just laid up there and you talked and chit chatted and looked at the road about half the time. And half the time you was looking places you shouldn't have been looking. You should have kept your eyes on the road because all them other idiots out there, because they was all driving just like you. They wasn't paying no attention either to what was going on. But you let it come a hard rain. You must be driving down the road in that car and you're just cruising along. And all of a sudden it starts a big downpour and you can't see out the windshield. And you're looking, you're looking for a bridge to get under or something. All of a sudden you go from just driving, not paying any attention, till you've got both hands white knuckled <laughs> on that steering wheel. And you're slowed down and one foot over the brake, you're driving like a woman, one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. <laughs> you're clutching an automatic, but you're white knuckled and you're holding on for dear life. And all of a sudden, you're not just driving out of habit, you're driving purposely, aren't you? You're purposely trying to line that thing up in between the lines or following the taillights and hopefully they're going the right place either not off of a bluff. But you let the rain go away and all of a sudden you forget about driving again and all of a sudden you just... Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. You go back that way. Now how come you drive like that? How come... You're able to drive four or five hours down the road, get home, and don't even remember the trip. I've done it on a motorcycle. I've rode a motorcycle off up in the mountains, rode all over the place. I remembered some of the things I saw, but I did not remember the tire being on the road. I did not remember having to hold the thing up. I did not remember how fast I went or anything. I just thought, you know, I was in Blue Ridge one minute, and two hours later, I was sitting at the house. Now how did I get here? I don't remember any of that trip. And I wasn't on drugs because I've never done any other than a Benadryl. But somehow or another, I did it. I was able to drive or ride automatically because of me. Well, there's a reason for that. The reason is, is because one day, back in the past, whoever that is, just tell them to quit. Now, I don't know who it is. Tell them I'm preaching. 
One day, when you was 16 or 15 or whatever, your daddy or your mama or your brother or somebody put you in an automobile and they said, here's the gas pedal, here's the brake pedal, here's the gear stick, here's the windshield wipers, and you had all these controls that you had to keep up with all at one time. And so you paid attention. Hopefully you paid attention. I don't know. I've Tristan about killed us up in Blue Ridge one day on the curve up there. That was one time. And then Katie, the and then Katie, she's still about to kill us every time we get in the car with her. But, but anyway, <laughs> she, she drives like a rant Faye. Nobody got to worry about her taking anybody to the store. But anyway, anyway. But there was a day that you paid close attention to your driving because you was learning. And so you, you paid close attention. And you learned. You went from having to focus and learn on something to all of a sudden it got down in your spirit. It got down in your in your in your in your subconscious mind to where you didn't have to think about driving anymore. You just went out there and turned the key and took off and drove. You was driving without thinking. I know a lot of people like that. Lois wears that horn out on Highway 5 driving with people that aren't thinking. <laughs> it's a good thing that exploder we had to not have a horn. She was wore out. But I want to tell you something. We do the same thing spiritually in our life. We set and we take in things. It, it may be, listen, it may be the local gossip down at the barber shop, but it affects you as a child of God. It affects you the way you think. It affects your attitude. You know, I, I, I used to go eat every morning with a bunch of old men in a cafe. I go down there every morning, down there below the house. And I just eat with this group of guys. And I sit there one morning and I'm just listening to these conversations going on around me from all these old guys. And it was always the same thing and nobody ever done nothing about it. They didn't like Obama. That's no new news. Everybody talked about how sorry everything was all the time ago, but nobody ever done anything about it. All they done was they sat around and talked about it. Yeah. And so they went in there every morning and they sat down at the table and their attitude stunk. Absolutely stunk. They had done it so much that it affected who they were and it affected everything about their life. I've got friends right now that are so bound up into listening and watching Fox News and so upset and living on the edge because of what's going on in the world and the political realm that they have no peace in their life. And they're supposed to be Christians. And they call me up and they tell me about all that's going on and how they're worried about all this kind of stuff and, and jump like that. And I'm like, have you read the Bible? Have you read what God has to say about these things? You're listening to bad news. You're listening to things that has affected you. Oh, it, might not have, it might have been entertaining at first. It might have been something that was intriguing and something that was cool to listen to at first. But after a while, old Rush will get down in here. And old Hannity will get down in here. And the next thing you know, you start looking at the world through their eyes. Instead of the eyes that God's given you. Amen? Amen? You start seeing where everything's going wrong instead of where the things are going right. Amen? I was eating the other morning and uh, went to the Waffle House. And I've just about quit all that stuff just because I can't hardly stand to listen to all the stuff that's going on around me. I tried the Bojangles in Jasper whenever Katie was going to college up there a couple of years ago. And um, I went to the Bojangles and I found out that I just had the same subject but a different group of men up there than I did down there in Wichita. So <laughs> I exited Bojangles and stayed out there. Because I have learned through life that you've got to separate yourself from the things of this world that will drag you down as a child of God. He wants to give you the peace of mind that Christ has for you. How can you have the mind of Christ in you if you fill your life with all the things of this world? And I'm not talking about sinful 
going out and drinking and stealing and running around on your spouse. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the attitude of the world. I'm talking about something that will hinder your walk with God and hinder your prayer life with God. Remember why I said that prayer is the most important thing that you can do as a child of God because it keeps the connection open between you and the Lord and gives you the mind of Christ so that you know what His will is for your life. So that you can recognize the miracles, recognize the blessings. See, that's what you want to do is you want to separate yourself from the attitude and the mindset that the world has and you want to walk in the, the mindset that God has given you. The mindset of Christ. And when you walk in that mindset, you'll begin to look around and recognize the miracles more than you do the shortcomings. I listened to a lady the other morning in the, the restaurant. Um, you know, she just was just she was bragging about how poor she was. And I've heard people do that all the time. I got kin folks. You, you listen to two uncles talk to each other. And they were serious. They weren't joking around. They were dead serious. They would brag about how poor each of them was and how poor they was than the other one. And they were dead serious. They wasn't joking about it. They were dead serious. But listen, as long as you, as long as you focus on what you don't have more than you focus on what you have, then you'll always fall short of what God wants to give you. That's what that's one of the things I love about your son. You know, Dwight and I have gotten close here the last couple of years. And, and you know what? Be honest, he's got his problems, I got my problems. And 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 but one thing I've noticed is buddy, he recognizes the blessings in his life. Every day, he recognizes what God is doing in his life. You know, you know what that tells me? You know what that tells me? Less of the negativity, less of the mindset of this world, and more of the focus on what God's doing and seeing the blessings around you. We have that old saying about count your blessings. And then in November, we all get online and we post every day what we're thankful for. One year I just got ridiculous and I thanked the Lord for gravy. All 30 days of November. I think that was last year. That was last year. I, I posted a different thing every day about gravy. How I was thankful for gravy just because I was poking, poking fun at some of my friends. But God's wanting you and I to focus our minds on the good things, the pure things. He wants you to see the blessing. That's in your life more than the shortcoming. If you focus on what you don't have, guess what? You'll have an increase of lack. If you focus, you take somebody that that is sick, that's wanting healing, and 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 Lois is a good example of this. I mean, when. Well, I'm, I'm saying that when Melvin's over here laughing, but let me finish the story. <laughs> You've drawn a conclusion there, attorney, before I've got to the end of my testimony. When there's a judge, yeah, I object. <laughs> Just sit down, counselor. Let me finish this story. <laughs> In 1993, when Lois was, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis that attacked her body, and, and I'm going to be honest, that, that was something that no, none of us had ever dealt with anything like that before in our life. Nobody in the history of her family had ever had to deal with this disease that anybody knew of. <clears throat> and, and to be honest, it was, a, it was a gut punch. Anybody here ever been punched in the gut? Yeah. Boy, it's a sick feeling, ain't it? Just bows you over double and it's like you want to throw up. And Sometimes you do throw up and then you still want to throw up. And if they keep punching you in the stomach, there's nothing left to throw up. And you just feel like you're going to die. Well, that's how we felt. Two little girls. One was only two year old. The other one's seven. 
Just a real sucker punch, gut punch. Not knowing how to deal with that. And, and just the, the psychological effect of that. You know, my, my dad, my dad passed away the next year, but I, I can remember my dad sitting there at the house just tore up and worried about that whole thing. My wife's the only person I ever seen my dad ever get excited and scared of at the same time. My dad liked to sit around the house in his underwear, and it didn't matter if it was the mailman or the insurance man, he wasn't getting up and putting his clothes on, but if my wife hit the back door, buddy, he was turning the house down getting his britches on. <laughs> he was scared to death of it. My, my, my dad was a big man like you, Jimmy. My dad was 375 pounds. He was a big man. But I guarantee you, I, <laughs> I'll tell you this, I heard a knock on the door one day. I was in the kitchen when I was a kid and I was fixing me a peanut butter sandwich. And I heard a knock on the front door and I knew Daddy was sitting there with the door open in his underwear. And I heard my dad say, Come on in! I thought, Man, Daddy's in his underwear ever sitting in Who is that? And it was the insurance man. Come in there to sell Daddy something. And because Daddy's belly was so big in a chair, it rolled over the top of his legs and it looked like a naked man sitting in a chair. <laughs> And that man was trying to sell my daddy insurance and he was looking at the floor the whole time. He wasn't even looking at him. He was looking at the floor. <laughs> but when Lois was diagnosed with that stuff, I'm going to tell you, people, God bless their heart because people are concerned about you. But people around us started to coddle to the disease. You know what I'm talking about? Not that I'll pray for you because that wasn't part of it. But it, it's almost like it's almost like a handicapped person that wants to do things for themselves, but everybody wants to rush around and do everything for them. And so they become mentally handicapped besides being physically handicapped. And they, believe me, there's a lot of people mentally handicapped. I see them in those parking spaces. They get out and walk and run the store better than me. <laughs> but when all that mess started and, and we started getting, and it was depressing. I'm going to tell you, it was a battle. Man, the devil was there and tearing down faith and the struggle. And then here come the mailman. And they don't help you any because they're sending you every kind of brochure on every kind of scooter and chair and wheelchair and, and what you're going to be facing and wanting you to do an MS walk when you can't even walk and you know all that kind of, all that kind of stuff are coming. And then there was the log book of all your feelings and your symptoms and all that we had to keep up. And then there was shots with needles about that long that had to be stuck into her and, and given those shots and stuff like that. So all this stuff just piled up around us. And then there's the family. <clears throat> You know, family's concerned. My mother, you know, she's got her already packed off in a casket somewhere, headed to the grave. Two or three more of them like that around. And you listen to all that. You listen to all that and you begin to have your faith tore down. You begin to think, well, maybe this is just something I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. Maybe God's not going to heal me. And so you settle in a lower plane and a lower place than where God really wants you to be. Jeff could have listened to what the doctor said and he wouldn't be here tonight. Amen. But he didn't listen to what the doctor right. said. I know because why is Kim coming here one day and told me, tell him to put that brace on. <laughs> <laughs> Because he refused to accept what somebody else said, but he believed what God said and what Christ did for him on the cross and received that healing. One of the greatest, one of the greatest miracles is when you can put aside everything that all the bad report and all the bad news that's coming at you from every direction and say, I'm going to believe what God says. I'm going to believe. I'm going to hold on to the cross. I'm going to hold on to what Jesus has done for me. 
And I'm going to live in that. And, and it may come to the day where you have to separate yourself from negativity and people that bring about a destructionist attitude in your life because God wants to bless you. God wants you to walk in that victory that He give you on the cross of Calvary. And I can remember the mailman was bringing all these brochures and stuff and it's just like the Lord spoke to us and said, throw all that mess away. Don't even read it. Don't even look at it. Matter of fact, I took her logbook. The only thing that I, she ever seen that came in the mail was insurance papers because she had to deal with that because I didn't know what was going on with it. But I kept the logbook and gave her the shots because I, I, mean, I couldn't give myself one. But I could sure stick her. <laughs> We refuse to believe the report of what the world said that you're going down. I'm going to tell you, that was a, that was a real test in our lives. And, and we, we were pastoring a church. We'd, we'd started a church. And we had an older lady that came to the church by the name of May Hughes. And Miss Hughes, I guess, done, done us one of the biggest favors of anybody. She gave the best piece of advice for anybody that's sick or struggling with something in their body, she gave the best advice that we ever heard, didn't she? Because Lois had made this statement out there one day or something. She said something about my MS. And Lord May Hughes heard it. And May Hughes jumped up off of a seat and she went over and cornered Lois Weeks up and she said, Honey, don't ever, ever say that that thing belongs to you because it don't belong to you. It belongs to the devil. Don't you claim it. Don't you claim it. I hear people all the time, well, my diabetes and my cancer, my this and my that, my that. Listen, that is what the world wants you to believe. <clears throat> but God wants you to believe something else. He wants you to believe His report. You're a child of God. You've got His favor. What happens is we, we mess up that connection by, by allowing all those negative things into our life that disrupt the channel, that gives you that old fuzzy static, static sound that my wife can't stand on a real radio, but that static gets in the way. I'm going to tell you, there's some things in your life that if you get to asking God about, God may say, well, hey, you know, you need to quit. That's a scary thing, but you got to be honest when you go to your prayer closet and ask the Lord. Say, Lord, what is it that's hindering my life? What is it that's hindering my prayer life? What is it that's hindering my victory? <laughs> you might be surprised. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I grew up watching wrestling. I loved Gordon Soley. I mean, I watched it from the time I was a little big boy back when El Mongo. You remember when El Mongo, you sit up till 11 o'clock at night, my uncle would get off the thread mill, my grandma, she'd cook eggs and those little red hot sausages. And I'd wait on my uncle to get off from the thread mill. Me and him would have breakfast at midnight watching El Mongo and the assassins. And back when wrestling one, wrestling two was all going. And boy, I'm going to tell you, I was really into that. Yeah. Lord, I'm telling you what, I, I'd get excited. I'd go to Cobb County Civic Center and, and I, I'd, I'd fight all the way back home wanting to imitate those people. My Uncle Ernest, my Uncle Ernest was so much into it that you couldn't go to his house on wrestling night because you'd think he was going to get punched or body slammed in the living room. He got so excited about it. But you know, when I got older and got saved and they listen they ain't nothing wrong with that but the Lord said you know what you just don't need that in your life same way with car racing Andy I spent my weekends at that racetrack over where me and you both did there's no telling how much money I have sunk into those three racetracks over there but it was one of those things the Lord said, you don't need this in your life. You don't need this. In Same way with the drinking thing. You know, I tried drinking. About three years into that, and the Lord just 
took the desire completely away and just don't need it. I tried to start smoking, but I was a bad failure at that. Well, that I never could. I, I'd try to inhale and I'd just almost die right there from coughing so much. I just never could ever do it. I just never could ever do it. But dipping and chewing, I did a lot of that. But it come a point in my life where the Lord says, you don't need it anymore. I'm going to tell you, if you will get in your prayer closet and be serious with the Lord and just ask Him, say, God, what is it? What is there in my life that hinders my walk with You? What is it in my life that, that, that makes me look at, look at life in a wrong perspective? Where did I begin to look at all this that I don't have and I focus on that more than I focus on what I do have. Amen. All the blessings of God in my life. How about you? Amen. I want those blessings. I don't want that. I don't want